So in this lecture we cover a small group of organisms whose placement is really important for understanding the evolution of animals, the Ketognatha. So we're making a major transition. Uh, these are the organisms we've uh, covered thus far and we're leaving the Protostomia and going into the Ketognatha. So that, notice the Ketognatha has a very long branch smack dab in between the Protostomia and the Deuterostomia. And the exact placement of this group is uncertain because it shares uh, a, a very long evolutionary history in which makes it hard to place phylogenetically, but it has certain characteristics of the protostomia and the deuterostomia. As far as synapomorphies for the group, they have spines that surround the mouth that are going to be important in foraging, and they also have a unique ciliary uh, sensory uh, system. The Keating nests are very small, elongated, streamlined invertebrates that are commonly referred to as the arrow worms. There are only about 120 species, and they all have this general um, structure of, of having these caudal fins and paired lateral fins, and usually a very translucent appearance, which is going to be important for their foraging and anti-predator strategies. They're triploblastic eucelomates, and they do show bilateral symmetry with a head, trunk, and tail region. They do show some pretty strong cephalization. Their support and skeletal system is primarily just hydrostatic support. They do have a fluid-filled coelom, and the hydrostatic pressure associated with that coelom is what gives them their uh, shape. But they also do have dense musculature that provides some additional support. They have longitudinal muscles that make up the most of their muscular system, and it's concentrated in four large bands that run the length of the body. They do have smaller circular and transverse muscles present that help them in their undulation motion while they swim. They do have complex head musculature, which is important for movement of the spines and the teeth, and then a muscular hood that can cover up these uh, spines when they're not foraging and they're swimming and they need greater hydrodynamic abilities. They do have a well-developed central nervous system, so the head contains a dorsal cerebral ganglion that's interconnected to uh, other ganglia that feed various sensory structures associated with the head. And then they also have this large ventral ganglia that is uh, more associated with the trunk region, and it has lots of radial branches that run to these four muscular bands that are important in controlling swimming. As far as their cephalization goes, they have these cephalic sensory structures that include eyes, which basically can sense direction and intensity of light, but they don't really form an image. They have this ring-like structure around their head called the coronal ciliate, and the, this is a patch of ciliated cells that actually circulates water over the head and likely helps them understand the chemosensory situation they're getting themselves into. But it may also assist in uh, gas exchange and getting rid of nitrogenous waste. Other sensory structures that line the body are ciliary fence and ciliary tough organs. These are rows of these that run the length of the trunk and they help to understand the distribution of uh, water disturbances and potentially detect prey and predators that are near them. And so here you can see a study that mapped these out. The ciliary trunk organs, or the CTO here in red, running down the length of the body. The ciliary fence organs are the uh, CFOs, the uh, green patches running the length of the body. As far as I mentioned locomotion, they're very good swimmers. They're uh, very streamlined bodies and coordinated contractions of the longitudinal muscles result in these body undulations. The paired lateral and caudal fins really act more for stabilization and directional control than they do as far as thrust goes. The spines, uh, as I mentioned, which are used during, during feeding, can be enclosed in this muscular hood when they're swimming. These are really important predators. They're keystone species in many zooplankton communities. They make these daily migrations in depth, so during the night period, they uh, will come to shallower areas where there's a lot of zooplankton and that's when they're doing their foraging. But at night they go to deeper depths to escape any visually oriented predator. And again, their translucent bodies help to uh, uh, protect them against being found by predators. Their prey primarily includes small crustaceans, but they will also eat fish larvae, and that's actually what's uh, pictured here. Their foraging strategies, they're pretty much sit-and-wait predators. 
any disturbance in the water uh, associated with those ciliary sensory structures, they'll detect that, and this triggers these spines to uh, grab hold of the prey, and then they're uh, chewed up with the teeth. And again, their translucent, transparent bodies also provide some protection from being sensed by their prey themselves. And they, again, being static, sit and wait predators, this also provides a little camouflage for them as well. And as I mentioned, the prey are actually captured with these spines, and the spines are actually movable. There's a lot of complex musculature associated with the base of these so that they can control individual spines. And once prey are captured, they can be immobilized with neurotoxins. And we'll talk a little bit more about the neurotoxins and how they get those later. It's actually from symbiotic bacteria. They have a relatively simple but complete digestive tract. Prey are brought in to the mouth, and then most of the digestion takes place in this long intestinal tract. They have an open circulatory system and their blood is clear, which is important given the importance of keeping their body translucent. But there is really is no heart. Blood movement is simply through peristaltic uh, actions of the intestines as they're feeding. And then also the swimming muscular contractions help to move the blood through the body. Being thin, small organisms, they can get by with just a gas exchange being cutaneous. And the same thing for excretory system, excretion and maintenance of water balances through diffusion as well. This actually makes them relatively sensitive to a narrow range of salinity and restricts their distribution. And we're going to uh, see in a little bit that that could actually be important using them as biomonitors of changing marine conditions. They're exothermic and this uh, sensitivity to uh, a narrow range of temperature also restricts their distributions to certain water depths and certain water regions. As far as reproduction, uh, they're monaceous, so an individual is both male and female, having a paired uh, set of ovaries and paired testes. Some species show patterns of protandry. Remember, this is where you, uh, if you're protandrous, you start off life primarily male, and then you develop female structures later on. And so when they're younger and smaller, this is when they produce sperm only, and then they move to a focus more on eggs later in life. They do show courtship before uh, exchange of sperm. Individuals will place a sperm packet on their mate, their chosen mate, and then sperm will enter the female uh, gonopore for internal fertilization. After this internal fertilization, eggs are released uh, shortly thereafter, and usually this occurs pelagically, so while they're in the zooplankton swarms, sometimes they will uh, attach the eggs to vegetation or benthic structures, the fertilized eggs. And some deep sea species actually do show a little bit of parental care by retaining the eggs in this external gelatinous chamber um, before the free swimming young are released into the environment. There are no real larval forms. It's uh, primarily just the juveniles re resemble just smaller adults. As their placement suggests, they show a mixture of deuterostome and uh, protostome-like characteristics. They do show holoblastic kind of spiral cleavage, but it has been modified some degrees. It's not the typical spiral cleavage you see in some protostomes. And the blastophore doesn't clearly form the mouth or the anus. Both of these are formed in different areas of the developing embryo. Very little information on their lifespan. May live for more than one year and reproduce once a year for a couple of years, but it's not really clear. If you look at a population, though, if you go sample though, them while they're feeding in zooplankton swarms, you'll see that the age structure of most populations is really biased towards juveniles. So they don't have very long lifespans, but they can re reproduce a great deal and produce a large number of juveniles in the population. So in a catch, you may get as little as 1 to 15 percent of that catch being adults. Their clear bodies, again, and stasis may reduce their uh, detection by predators. And some deep species are, are known to be bioluminescent, and they can actually produce these flash flashes of light, which is thought maybe to disorient or even deter an attacking predator if they are disturbed. Again, they're, they're pretty important keystone predators in a planktonic community, so they can often be found in dense aggregations. And sometimes in these aggregations, they'll actually turn on each other, and larger individuals will cannibalize the smaller individuals. Other than that, there really are no complex social interactions known. As I mentioned, they use neurotoxins to subdue their prey, and uh, these are produced by mutualistic bacteria that they're housing. 
All the ketonasts are marine. Again, mostly are found in zooplankton swarms. There are a few species that are restricted, however, to deep ocean habitats. And again, these dense aggregations make them really crucial in the planktonic food communities. About 5 to 30 percent of a zooplankton sample will be composed of ketogenous arrowworms. And as I mentioned, most of them have these daily migrations up and down the water column, so up at night for foraging and go to deeper waters during the day um, to escape visually oriented predators. But different species will use different depths for foraging, and this allows more species of arrowworms to coexist without competition in one given community. As I mentioned, um, they have very limited temperature and salinity tolerances, and knowing what the tolerance is for different species and tracking where those species are helps biologists uh, use them as uh, key bioindicators of changing water temperatures and salinities as climate change is, is causing um, changes in the water temperatures and associated salinities and also flow associated with certain uh, currents. And also because of their sensitivity, species with broad geographic ranges are actually showing shifts in the depths of the water that they use. And this is due to them being uh, forced to use deeper, colder waters as their distributions move away from the polar regions. Um, as you go away from these polar regions, there are fewer cooler water temperatures that they need to exist in. And so they're forced to stay away from perhaps the zooplankton swarms they would prefer in shallower waters because it's just too warm. So in review, the ketogenes are commonly referred to as the arrowworms. They're bilateral, triple blastic eucelomates. Their support structures are both muscular but primarily hydrostatic in nature using the salomic cavity as a support structure. They do have well-developed, um, mostly longitudinal muscles. They have a centralized nervous system showing a great degree of cephalization. So they have a ventral ganglia that runs the length of the body. I'm not sure why I have that in red there, so don't <laughs> give that any extra importance there. Uh, as far as the head goes, they do have light sensitive eyes. They don't really form a structure. A lot of the pictures I showed you, you could see this ring around the head. That's the coronal ciliate organ, which is uh, moving water uh, over the area of the head. They also have uh, ciliary fence organs uh, running the length of their body. They're good directional swimmers using uh, directional support from their lateral and caudal fins, but the swimming motion itself is due to the longitudinal muscles undulating their bodies. They're sitting weight predators, uh, making these daily migrations up to shallower waters to feed in zooplankton, then going to depths to escape predation. They have a complete, relatively simple digestive tract with an open circulatory system using the salomic cavity and without using a heart. Being thin and small, they can get by with cutaneous respiration and uh, excretion via diffusion, but again, these aspects also limit where they can exist in the water column. They're ectothermic. They're monoecious, uh, showing courtship and a placement of spermatophores, uh, where then you see internal fertilization. They're oviparous, and they do show some uh, modifications of spiral cleavage and holoblastic cleavage. The blastopore forming neither the mouth of the anus are not clearly showing protostome or deuterostome patterns. They don't produce larvae, but instead have direct development of, of young. And lifespan not really known may exceed one year in some with multiple bouts of reproduction. And the defense is linked to some of the same structures associated with their success as sitting weight predators, clear bodies, stasis, so being still. But the deeper sea versions can have uh, some protection via bioluminescence. They do show aggregations via schooling, but no real complex social interactions other than that. As far as symbiotic relationships, they do show some important mutualisms with bacteria that provide them with defensive products for uh, subduing their prey once they're captured with the spines that surround the mouth. They're all marine, mostly planktonic again, except for some of the deep sea versions. And they are very key members of the zooplankton community, representing a large amount of the biomass and eating a large a fraction of the prey in the zooplankton community. 
because of their limitations in uh, both uh, their tolerance to water and temperature, they can be used as bioindicators of change in water currents and the uh, physical characteristics of the water in different areas of the ocean as it changes.